Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network and our growing family of broadcast affiliates right across the world. If you'd like to give us a call, toll-free, 800-610-7035. Email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, TV, And our main website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. Exxon Nation, my first guest tonight is Oberon Zell. He is the headmaster at the Gray School of Wizardry. Now, Oberon has accomplished many things in his long and colorful career. A modern Renaissance man, Oberon is a transpersonal psychologist, metaphysician, naturalist, theologian, shaman, author, artist, sculptor, lecturer, teacher, and ordained priest of the Earth Mother Gia. Those who know him well consider him to be a true wizard in the traditional sense. He is also an innate in... The Egyptian Church of the Eternal Source, a priest in the Fellowship of Isis, and an innate in several different traditions of witchcraft. He holds academic degrees in sociology, anthropology, clinical psychology, teaching, and theology. And his website is www.oberonzell.com. And Oberon Zell, welcome to the X-Zone. How are you tonight, sir? I'm, I'm well, Rob. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. It's great having you with us. Uh, what started you on your quest to become a wizard? Well, you know, if you're really going to want to get the start, you'd have to go back to my earliest childhood. The very first reading that I did as a child when I learned how to read was children's versions of the Greek myths. Mm. And that's really pretty much what set me on the path after that, you know. Um, the, the The lore of mythology and of... Uh, and the, the stories, the legends, uh, it just kept on going. It took me into fairy tales, and it took me into science fiction and fantasy, and into the stranger parts of the world that you would call the X-Zone. I've pretty much lived my whole life in the X-Zone. And how has life been in the X-Zone? It's been a fascinating adventure, a constant adventure. Is it an adventure or more of a crusade or a quest? Well, you know, uh, sometimes it's been a quest. Mm-hmm. I, I have definitely gone on qu- major quests, the quest for the unicorns, the quest for mermaids. I, I, I pursued those as specific quests. Other times it's just been throwing myself out into into the wilderness, uh, finding those places on the map where it says, mm-hmm. here there be dragons, you know, the, the unmarked territories, and you never know what you're going to find. So sometimes you're better if you're not really looking for anything specific. But I, I have been times when I have looked for specific things and often found them. Really? Have you found unicorns, mermaids, or dragons? I have. I have. I, well, I raised unicorns for in the 80s. That's, that was a major thing I was doing, was raising unicorns. It was a huge, huge, huge thing. Uh, after, after a number of years of traveling all over the country mm-hmm. doing Renaissance festivals in the early 80s, I ended up working out a contract with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, and they continued exhibiting my unicorns all over the world. So that was a very successful quest and quite an adventure. Where in the name of heaven uh, did you find unicorns? Well, I I discovered the secret of how they had been produced in ancient times. It was was, while doing research for a book that I finally wrote. uh, It took a long time to get around to it. The book is called The Wizard's Bestiary. And um, they, but I had the idea with my wife Morning Glory, who is unfortunately no longer with us on this plane. I'm sorry to hear that. But she, yeah, it was really we were together for over 40 years. Yeah. It was, it's it's really hard for me to to imagine life being without her, which is what I'm having to live. But we had incredible adventures together, mm-hmm. and one of those was our pursuit of mythical 
creatures and lore. We just wanted to learn the true stories behind the myths. And in the process of our research, we came upon the secret of the unicorn, that they had actually been produced by a lost method of animal husbandry that had been a closely guarded secret in ancient times. And we were able to reconstruct it and produce real live unicorns. It was quite an amazing thing. Oberon, you and I have to take our first commercial break. We'll be back in two minutes. Exo right. Nation, All my right. very special guest this hour is Oberon Zell. His website is www.oberon. Z-E-L-L dot com. That's www.oberonzell.com. And uh, we'll be back on the other side of this commercial break. It's going to be a very interesting and educational hour this hour here in the X-Zone as we continue to investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology from our broadcast center right here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And coming to you around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network and our growing family of broadcast affiliates right around the world, as well as our many satellite programming providers. I'll be back in two minutes with Oberon Zell, right here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. So Nation Oberon Zell is our very special guest. He's the headmaster at the Gray School of Wizardry. His website is www.oberonzell.com. Now, Oberon, you and uh, Morning Glory were together for over 40 years until her recent death on May 13th. And your life story has recently been published by Llewellyn and is entitled The Wizard and the Witch, Seven Decades of Counterculture, Magic, and Paganism. How did this book come about? Well, all of my life, uh, people have been telling me that, um, you know, I should have my life story should get to, should get written. And I always always say, well, if I tried to write my life story, they'd have to publish it as science fiction. And I kind of laughed and dismissed the idea, but continued having great adventures with Morning Glory and, and our incredible life together. And eventually we were approached by someone who'd been kind of following our career and, and been sort of a friend on the edges for decades and he pursued a path in journalism specifically with the intention that eventually he wanted to be able to be the biographer for us both, you know. And his name was John Sulak, and he kind of uh, cut his teeth on doing a book called Modern Pagans, in which he did extensive interviews on uh, of, of many major figures in the pagan movement. It was a really good book, and so he just proved he could do it. And that was his idea, was to do this as a um, narrative history in which he would interview us and um, and everybody else who knew us over the years. Well, maybe not everybody, obviously, but lots of people. And, and everybody cheerfully jumped into this and was happy to give interviews. And then he would run by the edited versions, and we would go over them and fill in the gaps. And it worked out really well, but it took a long time. It was a very lengthy project. We ended up with about twice as much as the publisher wanted, and that was after condensing and editing down over and over and over again because he recorded hundreds and hundreds of hours and transcribed them. It's an amazing task that he did. And the final result is the, is the book, and at least um, there's at least two or three more <laughs> books worth of uh, material that ended up on the cutting room floor, and perhaps we'll figure out something to do with that someday. Now, I also under, I understand that you're the founder of the modern paganism, uh, the spiritual movement of earth-centered religion. Now, what is modern paganism, and what are its goals? Well, paganism is the old religion, really. It's it's what it's what all the people of the world um, were doing, and and how they uh, their ways mm-hmm. and customs before the, uh, in many cases, actually brutal conquest of these peoples by uh, the advancing more aggressive uh, religions of uh, of monotheism and and uh, so these are nature religions these are tribal religions these are the customs that are familiar to us with all the holiday celebrations these are the the religious context for the myths and legends that we're all familiar with really paganism is incredibly familiar you just have to dig down just a little deeper to the source of the of the folklore and the songs and the stories and there it is 
And what the modern pagan movement is trying to do is to recover and reclaim our lost heritage and the connections that bring all this stuff together. Because all these threads that we have, the, the stories, the customs, all mm -hmm. these things, are parts of what was once a, uh, a, a major worldwide appreciation, which we still see echoed in in the survivals of cultures like the Native American cultures or indigenous peoples in the um, uh, Pacific Islands and Australian Aboriginals and so on like that. Pretty much any Aboriginal tribal people hold to the same perspective. Mm -hmm. And in my travels all over the world, I've had the opportunity to to sit down and hang out with uh, shamans and, right. and tribal elders of all these things. And we're all fine. We're we're exactly on the same page with, with everything. The core of it all is a common uh, honoring and reverence for Mother Earth, the most universal archetype. Everybody in the world knows who Mother Earth is and feels this kinship. You know, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, yeah. we evoke her all the time. Mother Goose. The, the ancient Greek, exactly. Well, that's a little different, but it's close. Yeah. Mother, the Mother thing is, is, is deep, deeply embedded in with us. The word that we use in the Western world primarily... Um, is Gaia, because this is the root, this is the Greek name for her, and it's the root of all of our words like geography and geology and geophysics and geopolitical, and all that comes from the Greek name for her. But we also use, um, our word Earth comes from the um, from the Germanic Hertha, you know, so it's all there, and, and we just hold this. The common ground being that it is understood that the Earth, the living, the planet, the entire biosphere of Earth is actually one vast living system. Uh, literally, not, not just metaphorically, mm -hmm. because all life on Earth derives from a single, original, primordial ancestor um, that, it, whose DNA we all share. All life on the planet shares the same DNA for, derived from a common ancestor. So, so like, as we as individual beings are made of trillions of cells, but we all started with one single fertilized cell. That's where our DNA is formed. The same is true for all life on the planet. And as for where that came from, I, I personally lean towards the, towards the panspermia idea that the spores of life were brought here, you know, in comets and have pr probably are everywhere in the universe. I, I strongly expect that to be the case. So why, the, why all the different religions, why all the different philosophies and why didn't the the um, the mother earth religion live on and continue well it did and it does and is still deeply embraced by indigenous peoples all over the world mm -hmm. i mean uh, check out in in, in uh, South America. You have the Pachamama Alliance, which is a very living thing of indigenous peoples. Pachamama means Earth Mother in uh, you know in in uh, the Peruvian language of the uh, Quechua, and and so it's it's still here all all the time. It's still here. We can still evoke that thing. We still find her showing up in commercials and in imagery. But what happened was that aggressive, um, hostile uh, religions that revolved around a sky father of destruction and violence emerged. And the beginning of that really, um, seriously, is traced back to about 1650 or so BCE, or 1627, actually, the specific date, when the island of Thera exploded uh, north of Crete that gave us our legends of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And that was part of a general conflagration that occurred all over the uh, Mediterranean world with meteoric strikes, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, just all hell broke loose. It's what, it's where the story of the Exodus comes from, and the story of the war in heaven derives from this. And the impact of nickel iron meteorites at that time gave us the dawn of the Iron Age. The word Aryan, as in the Aryan invasion, uh, means iron, and that word means meteorite. And so what happened was that suddenly this nickel iron meteorite stuff became available and people were able to forge it into weapons if they had the technology to work with copper and bronze the technology to work with meteoric iron was right there now working with iron ore the smelting process is much more complex and that took a, you know a thousand more years to master but being able to work with meteoric iron was easy and the invaders who uh, carried this stuff were from the steppes of Asia, north of the Black Sea, 
And their mythology was not based on the earth. It was based on the sky because they're the ones who gave us the names and the stories of the constellations. And that was their mythology and their markers was from the sky. So suddenly they're, they're gods of the sky or hurling thunderbolts to the earth. And so we get the advent of these thunderbolt hurling gods of destruction and violence and married with the uh, um, horseback riding invaders with iron swords and spears and iron weapons, they just rode roughshod across the civilized world and destroyed cities and temples and peoples, and it was brutal. And we see the stories of these conquests are part of our heritage. Um, I mean, you, you can get you can get a, some really great versions of that in the Bible, which has okay. preserved a lot of the of the stories. But in other cultures as well, we have it. And so that's what happened. It was a brutal, violent, destructive um, takeover. And some people managed to hold out in isolated places, indigenous tribal peoples that weren't hit. But over time, the expanding empires that rose from this reached out and, mm -hmm. and kept spreading. The Romans kept spreading northwards and, and eastwards. And, um, and you know, when Islam and Christianity arose, they continued the conquests throughout the world just trying to subjugate everybody to their particular perspective. And anybody who tried to hold out was generally murdered because <laughs> these are the guys who had all the weapons, you know. So, so in, what you, happened. in your opinion, is paganism making a comeback? It is. It's becoming huge. It's considered to be the fastest growing religion in the English-speaking countries, and it's beginning to really take off in other countries as well, like the Baltic areas mm -hmm. and the northern countries. It's become um, an official uh, religion in places like Iceland right now and in Lithuania, where it's, where it's recognized on a par with um, any other religion. And now there are considered to be millions of adherents worldwide. It's, it's just huge. In countries that ask religious affiliation on their censuses, paganism is really leaping forward in the united states we don't do that but i believe in canada that it's still a question on the census and that the numbers of canadians proclaiming paganism is skyrocketing every time they do a census so why, why do you think paganism is making such a comeback well i think we feel that something is missing i there's there's this there's this sense um mm -hmm. You know, when we hear these stories, the popularity of the, of the stories, look at the movies that draw from these ancient myths and traditions and stories. I mean, you know, how many times have the remade versions of, you know, Jason and the Argonauts or, or, or Hercules or something like that, you know? Um, we, we feel this deep within our soul that, that somehow we've been cut off with our heritage. You know, we, we try to form groups and, and alliances of uh, groups of friends and stuff that are trying mm -hmm. to recall that sense of tribal identity that we used to have. The, the appeal of going out camping and sitting around the campfire and telling stories is, is huge and deep. You know, and there's a resonance. There's a deep resonance. When you, get a, when you get a movie like Avatar that is just purely pagan in its right. entire perspective, everything, and it's hugely popular. Look at the Harry Potter phenomenon, the enormous popularity. That isn't even religion. It doesn't even really touch on paganism. Well, but no, it, but, we can, but also, it, we can also talk about the, the vampire diaries and, and you know, oh, yeah. werewolves. It's, it seems that society is looking for an alternative because, in my opinion, the established religious philosophies just aren't cutting it in this world anymore. Exactly. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And they've betrayed us, really. Religion, the word means relinking. Religion is supposed to reconnect us with everything. But instead, these churchianity religions are doing the exact opposite. They try to pit everybody against each other. They're exclusionist, and they say everybody else is the enemy, and you yeah. have to... You know, fear them and hate them. They're hate-based religions. Oh, Baron, we've got to go take we've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Great having you with us. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here on the Exxon. Exo Nation, my, my guest pleasure. this hour is Oberon Zell. He's the headmaster of the Gray School of Wizardry. www.oberonzell.com. We'll be back on the other side of this news break. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. 
Worldwide toll-free, 800-610-7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. Yeah, Exxon Radio TV, that's right. Thanks, Craig. And our main website is www.exxonradiotv.com. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is Oberon Zell, and he is the headmaster at the Gray School of Wizardry, and his website is OberonZell.com. Um, before we went to the commercial break, we were talking about uh, how paganism is coming back. Well, it really never left. But right. it, more and more people are returning to their ancient roots, so to speak, their ancient beliefs. Uh, is, is this what people within the paganistic movement call the awakening? It is. It is very much. In fact, the 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 awakening is is conceived of it's it's a it's a persistent mythos mm-hmm. and you know, and i found it when we talk to indigenous elders and teachers and shamans it it's an amazingly persistent mythos and the idea is that um a a kind of uh, that, well great there have been times before at renaissance periods um every 60 years like mm-hmm. clockwork there's a mini renaissance and and several of these have been called awakenings. The Great Awakening of the 1720s is is a classic one, for example. And so the, the term is often used that way. In a deeper sense, um, uh, some of us carry it even further and feel that the the spirit of the planet, the soul of the, of the planet, is awakening as um, as we feel that she had been perhaps in ancient times when people seem very close to that I see. and has been knocked out by the, the horrific events that have happened over the last three, 600 years or so that have been just knockout blows one after another. The, the destructions I mentioned before, the violence, the wars, mm-hmm. the, the inquisitions, the witch burnings, the holy wars, which there's the term that ought to be an oxymoron. You know, the Holocaust and such like that, these are right. brutal just brutal and they have they have shocked the psyche of humanity into a kind of a post traumatic shock syndrome that we've all been enduring and i think the entire planetary soul of gaia has been in a state of post traumatic shock but and in a coma really and i i feel many of us do that she is beginning to awaken again and that this rising new movement we're seeing and the visions that people are having around it and the spontaneous emergence this is not being propagated like other religions by some great prophet going out and spreading the word it's not happening that way people are are spontaneously awakening and coming to it and their reaction when they discover that there are others is wow i thought i was all alone i didn't know that there are others too i feel like i've come home And then we get to say the most beautiful words that we have to say, which is, welcome home. Wow. Tell me about the Church of All Worlds. Well, the Church of All Worlds, um, this is interesting, the Church of All Worlds has now been around for 52 years. We we really had our official founding on April 7th of 1962 as a result of having read um, and been inspired by a science fiction novel by, by Robert Anson Hyland called Stranger in a Strange Land. And that came out in October of 1961, and it had a huge impact in, the, uh, in those days. It was a major cultural factor in the entire 60s revolution, really. You know, um, that came out in 1961. The pill was invented in 1960. You know, uh, there was a lot of stuff that happened right at the beginning that took a while to percolate through the culture. But this was the this one tied it together with a philosophy and a vision and ideas that just galvanized people. And uh, they had to do with things like imminent divinity, Mm -hmm. the idea that divinity is something that is within us, that we share, that we're all part of a larger thing. That was huge at that time. And and there's so much else really too. Um, Stranger in a Strange Land. I don't know. Have you read that? No, I haven't. No, well, I haven't. You, you might want to look into it because it's still it's still amazing. Um, I still run into people all the time who say, "Oh, I must have mm-hmm. given away hundreds and hundreds of copies of that book over the years." And so, in the book, um, a a church is created to to sort of propagate the. The, the concepts that are introduced in the book, and it's called The Church of All Worlds, intended to be all-inclusive, that everybody can be a part of it. It doesn't include, it doesn't exclude, you know, people who are Christians or Jews or Buddhists or right. Muslims even, really. It's, it's, it's an inclusive place where we can all 
get along. It's the idea is like everybody brings their best dish to the potluck, you mm, know, and shares it. I love that it. idea. I love that yeah, idea. Yeah, that's, that's our vision of religion. That's how it should be. So um, so we started the Church of All Worlds. We were legally incorporated on March 4th of 1968. We got our 501c3 on June 18th of 1970. And, um, and we were the very first uh, group, first religious group, first church, to proclaim our affiliation as pagan. And that was in 1967. And I seem to have been the first person in modern times to use the word as a personal identity to say, uh, I'm a pagan, we're pagans. And before that, the word had always been used as a uh, derogatory to right. those pagans, you know. And so claiming it personally puts me in a position of sort of being a father of the whole pagan movement, you know, which is amusing, really, because I'm not really that kind of a patriarchal sort of person. But but it is nice to have a... I'm, I'm proud of my kids, as it were, you know, <laughs> if that's the case. So tell me, how do you... How do you succumb the dogma that's already associated through society with the word pagan well it's not our dogma see that's that's the thing you know it's it's other people's ideas of what we are but when we just talk about it it's really pretty simple mm-hmm. you know we just honor nature and life and um we have one rule in the church of all worlds one one single commandment we get by with we don't need 10 of them or all the rest ours is simply be excellent to each other which we cribbed, of course, from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which we thought was was very appropriate term. So that's it. That's all we have to say. Just as in witchcraft, there's one commandment, which is basically harm none. That's right. You know, and we go along with that too. You know, the idea of of not harming and of um, in being excellent seems well, like a good thing to do. I agree, I agree <laughs> yeah. with you 100. percent Now, is there a connection be- between paganism and witchcraft or Wicca? Well, witchcraft is sort of the largest uh, denomination within paganism. It's sort of like within Christianity, you have you have hundreds of Protestant sects, yes. and then you have the, the Catholic Church, which is huge. And um, in paganism, there are there are lots of different paths and traditions. Uh, many of them are based on um, nationalities, like you've got the Greek traditions and the Egyptian mm-hmm. and the Norse and the Mesopotamian and. European, Native American, Indian, Hindu, African, that kind of stuff. Witchcraft is, um, is is fairly coherent. There are many, many different traditions within witchcraft, but it has that same sort of a of a large overall semblance that the Catholic Church has. That it has common uh, common elements that are, are universal, and so people can go from one. Uh, coven one tradition to another one and and recognize much of the the common liturgy and symbolism and stuff so it's probably the largest path within the overall pagan movement gotcha you know. so so how does one get indoctrinated into the pagan um, religion because you know it, in in Christianity it's the baptism how is it in, yes. how is it in uh, in paganism well, we don't use words like indoctrination, of course. That tends to sound like somebody is trying to shove it down your throat, and we are very much opposed to to uh, trying to do that. To The very idea of what we call prostitution is an offense, we think. We don't want anybody in here who doesn't really want to come in mm-hmm. here of their own free will, you know? So there is that. But the initiation is what the term is. And um, uh, there, there are different ways of being initiated in different groups. Um, but it's not unlike the initiations you find in societies like the Masons or, you know, or things like that. There's a, there's a ceremony of welcoming is really what it is, and that's your initiation, and you're welcomed into the community, and it's very beautiful and generally very simple, really. Some of them are, some of them have more bells and whistles than mm-hmm. others because every group has their own version. But in essence, that's always what it is. It's a welcoming into the group. Excellent. Now tell me, Halloween is coming up soon. Everybody knows is. that. Uh, is that important to pagans? And and how will oh, you oh, be? Yeah. <laughs> how how are you going to be celebrating uh, Halloween? Well, I've got I've got three different things all lined up for it. Actually, or actually four of them really. Right now, we're in the final stages of of decorating our house for our annual Adams family reunion party that we have here every year, and this will be the fourteenth. And we we have all of our friends come, and we just have a wonderful. Um, Halloween party kind of an event, and right. we have a we have a graveyard um, which has headstones that I have 
made mostly out of styrofoam over the years to commemorate beloved people who have died, and we do them just like the headstones you'd find in a regular graveyard, and we set them up. And over the years, there have been lots and lots of them added. And um, the latest one, of course, is Morning Glories, and I have gone to a lot of extra trouble to make hers of marble. And it's not the same one as that we will have on her grave. She was buried in a green burial on our sacred land, and that's another whole story, very special. But that's the first part of it. Halloween is the festival that in the pagan um, lore is called Samhain, which means summer's end. It's spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but it is not pronounced Samhain. It's pronounced Samhain. And it just means summer's end, and it's the last of the three great harvest festivals. And that's the time we honor our beloved dead. And so we'll be doing that um, up on our land, and that's always the first weekend in November. But in the meantime, there is actually Halloween, and I'll be going trick-or-treating with my granddaughter, <laughs> as I do every year. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put on my wizard really regalia, and we'll all go out and have a good time around the neighborhood with all the other parents. And people will say, nice costume, and I'll say, it's not a costume. <laughs> and, and we have a lot of fun doing that. The day following that is the big spiral dance, which is a huge, huge ritual in San Francisco that Starhawk has been doing every year for decades. And thousands of people actually come to this, and it's a commemoration of the ancestors and the beloved dead. And it's a fabulous, amazing, theatrical extravaganza ritual thing. And Morning Glory is going to be particularly honored in this, so I've been invited as a special guest to be there, and there will be a whole shrine set up for her because she was deeply beloved by the entire pagan community. Everybody who who knew her or knew of her even has just loved her so much. She's well, she was a morning glory. She was uh, one of a kind. And then, um, and, and so that will be happening. So uh, these are the four events that I've got coming up right now, uh, and it's all very intense time of the year. Plus, plus gigs. I'll be traveling off to Georgia to to Atlanta next week for the gathering of the tribes, where I'll be doing that all weekend. So I've got a lot going on my plate right now. And, and, you're, and you're, also, you're also the headmaster of the Gray School of Wizardry. Now, as a wizard, I, kn- I know that you're a wizard, but how can we explain to our listeners what a real wizard does? Like, are, would you be well, the equivalent to Merlin or the Wizard of Oz? Or? Yeah, sort of, or Gandalf, or mm-hmm. Obi-Wan Kenobi, um, uh, or any of the other figures of wizards that come down in both uh, lore and legend as well as in real life. Wizard means wise one, really, and so... Um, uh, just as philosopher means a lover of wisdom, uh, a wizard is is basically wrapped around wisdom. And wisdom boils down to one simple thing, really. Wisdom is all about considering the consequences. And we have the examples of the three wise men in the in the Bible who came and visited baby Jesus and brought gifts and stuff. Those were right. wizards. They were magi, in fact, were from where we get our word magic. These were Zoroastrian priests from Persia. And, and they're the prototype. And and we have famous wizards of history as well as myth, not just Merlin, but people like Leonardo da Vinci and, uh, uh, you know, Isaac Newton and, and many other people. We use the word today to refer to people who strike us as being particularly wise and amazing. Uh, uh, Thomas Edison was called the Wizard of Menlo Park. The word is, is used for people like Bill Gates, even. you know, yeah. Computer geniuses are called wizards. So the word is widely used all over the place, and it always has the same concept. You're talking about somebody who knows stuff that most people don't know, and people go to them for advice and counsel because they're wise. So would a wizard in, in the First Nations be a shaman or the medicine yes, man? Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. Absolutely. The, the shaman, the medicine man is the, is the wizard. Um, the modern analog that we have is the professor. You know, we talk right. about the professors, and that's that's the wizard. The, uh, the the regalia, the costumery associated with wizardry, is basically academic regalia. It's the same thing as you see at any graduation at a big university. So that's what that is. And the job of a wizard primarily is being a mentor and a teacher for the next generation of um, of young heroes. The I mentioned before the sixty year Renaissance yes. cycle. That mm-hmm. the last one was the nineteen sixties. We got the twenty twenties coming up. But if you if you pinpoint and go back sixty year cycles all the way back to the Italian Renaissance, you'll find that an uncanny match. And the thing is that sixty years after having been uh, involved in such a Renaissance, 
60 years later, the um, uh, the next gener- the, the generation who came of age during that period are in their 80s, and then they're qualified to help guide the next ones in. So having been a part of a major figure in the uh, renaissance of the 1960s, I, I'm, I'm anticipating um, taking that role of the mentor to a larger venue in the 2020s, but I've already got a head start on it with my school and stuff. Right. I love what you're doing. I love what you're saying. Thank you. And it makes sense. And you know, when it makes sense, it feels right. And when it feels right, you know it is right. Well, that's kind of the way we operate, yeah. You know, And if it don't make sense, then don't buy it. You know? Exactly. <laughs> O'Brien, you and I have to take our final break for this hour. Please stand by. Great talking to you. Right. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us tonight here in the Exxon. Thank you. I'm having fun, Rob. Exxon Nation, O'Brien Zell is our very special guest www.oberonzell.com that's O-B-E-R-O-N-Z-E-L-L.com and he is the headmaster of the Gray School of Wizardry and Oberon and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon but before we go I'd like to remind everyone about my online petition at www.stopebolapetition.com I can't believe it members of the media www.oberonzell.com is the website for my guest Canada, this hour. Oberon back to Canada. He's the headmaster of the Gray School of Wizardry. Areas in West Africa, First of all, Oberon, where there's Ebola. great to have you on the show. Thank Does you very much for joining racist? us, and I look forward all to the next time you meet my country. with us back my here in the action. But tell us about I'll the be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Well, I'm very proud of the Gray School, really. It was an idea whose time had come, but something that I've been actually contemplating for decades Back, back in, um, I mentioned before that the Church of All Worlds was founded in 1962. Well, that was also the year the X-Men comics first premiered with uh, the idea of Dr. Professor Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters. And, and I was very inspired to that. I took, I took full courses in education. I got a teacher certificate. I taught public school for many years, worked in school system, all sorts of stuff like that, and had in mind that someday it would be really good to create a school that was what I thought a school should be like, you know, because what's happened with the universal education as a goal, we've we've lost track of the idea that schools were once mystery schools. They were mm-hmm. once designed to teach um, secrets and lore and arcane stuff. They were the earliest schools were founded in ancient Greece by philosophers, and Confucius had a school, and people that that was where schools were. You would go to get an esoteric education, not a public education. And and we've lost a lot of that, and I, I certainly think that public education is a great idea, and don't get me wrong there, I'm not saying we shouldn't have it, but but the classical studies that um, used to be a part of the of education, the, the mysteries, the really cool stuff, we've lost a lot of that, and um, I, developing a church and a religious movement took an awful lot of my time over the last few decades, but finally, when the Harry Potter phenomenon became so hugely popular, I, I realized that perhaps people are finally ready for the school idea mm-hmm. to be manifest. So I turned my attention to, to that, and I wrote, um, I wrote the book, The uh, Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, which became a fundamental textbook for a school that I then subsequently put into effect. The Gray School of Wizardry um, at grayschool.com opened its virtual doors just 10 years ago on August 1st of 19... I'm uh, sorry, of 2004, and it has been a phenomenal success. We now have over 470 classes wow. in six, 16 departments. We've got over 30 teachers, 400 and some students. It's um, a number of graduates. We've just opened up a virtual school in Second Life, so now if people want to wander around a great castle kind of a scenario, we mm-hmm. have that now. And it's worldwide. We have students in 50 countries around the world, quite a few in Canada. It's, it's probably right after the United States. Canada is our most popular um, number of students. And it's, it's just, I'm very, very pleased with it. It's going really, really well. Excellent. The, the different departments encompass all, all aspects of, of knowledge and learning, just the way the different departments in a university are designed to encompass that. And we have, But we've tried to marry... Uh, to restore the link between the mysterious and the mundane. You know, that, that X-Zone thing again that you right. talk about. We right. really try to bring that into our system. So 
you know, so we teach like you know physics and we teach philosophy and we teach metaphysics and we teach you know um, quantum theory and we teach magical practices and we teach um, you know all that stuff that was once all together. I mean Isaac Newton, for example, is considered to be the first of the great scientists, but he was also one of the last of the great wizards too, and he never did not think of any distinction. That distinction was created artificially in 1660 when the Royal Academy of Science decided that it would purge the the metaphysics from the physics, the astrology from the astronomy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Oberon, you and I have to say so long for tonight. The next time you come on, I would like to, to spend the entire hour talking about your school. I would love that. Okay. Oberon, no, take... It's been wonderful to talk to you. It's been great talking to you. Continued success, and thank you for doing the great work that you do. Thank you, Rob. Good night, Blessed Oberon. Be. Blessed be to Good you, time. too, my friend. Exonation, www.oberonzell.com is Oberon's website. And I'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exxon from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. (laughs) 